Awesome. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're here to talk about our experience with other set of cast markers also applied to uh, sweet potato breeding. Um, that's a work I started developing when I was a molecular breeder at the International Potato Center and brought the uh, work uh, to the Federal University of Sousa when I became an assistant professor there. Um, so my name is Guilherme da Silva Pereira, but people call me Gui for short. Um, I'm gonna quickly show some of the uh, results in on linkage and QTL analysis that based our uh, our uh, design of cast markers very quickly because Marcelo and Gabriel already showed you some of the results. And then I'm gonna talk about the cast marker development and validation because that's the step we are at. Uh, we are not actually applying it yet. Uh, I think uh, Simon is gonna be able to show us application uh, before we do. Uh, and then I added something about, about quality assessment and quality control because that's actually how we started uh, working with CASP. Uh, and I'm just gonna see if I have time to do it. If, don't, if, if I don't, I'll just skip it. All right, so we know uh, sweet potato is a uh, autohexaploid species, right? Very important for the carbohydrates, especially starch, fiber, vitamins, and minerals. But it became a game changer because of the uh, beta carotene content, uh, which is the variety that we eat a lot here in, in, in the US and Europe, but not as much in, in Africa. So uh, part of the work at the International Potato Center was uh, you know, involved with was to bring uh, uh, beta carotene rich varieties uh, to Africa, right? Of course, this has uh, a lot of implications because it changes the texture of the uh, varieties that people are used to consume in, in, in Africa, right? Um, and some of the reasons, or the main reasons, are uh, the fact that the QTLs overlap a lot, right? So this is the BT. Uh, mapping population, uh, we just uh, saw uh, the results about 15 linkage groups and uh, phenotype for a bunch of um, uh, phenotypes, including dry matter starch, which are positively correlated, beta carotene, flesh color, uh, negatively uh, positively correlated among them, between them, and uh, negatively correlated with uh, starch and dry matter. But also other uh, carbohydrates like glucose, sucrose, skin color, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, we've already seen that the chromosomes uh, 3 and 12 uh, have a lot of uh, these uh, QTL, right? And these are just examples of different environments where people tested uh, this population, either in Peru or Ghana, uh, but also uh, draw attention to the skin color uh, QTL, which is also on chromosome 12, but in a different location. Uh, the other uh, population we used was uh, Tanzania by Beauregard population, uh, another uh, map built uh, with map poly and the QTL poly was used for uh, detecting the QTL. So trimeric start beta carotene flesh color again, glucose and beta amylase. So beta amylase also uh, escapes the trains of having uh, QTL on chromosome three and 12, right? Now we have it on chromosome uh, 13. All these uh, QTL explain a lot individually of the uh, phenotypic variation up to 0.6, right? Uh, so we decided to uh, pick some of these uh, QTL uh, to design uh, cost markers and see how they would perform in uh, multi-parental population, right? So we'll test it, we design them based on biparental population, but then we use them in multiply the population. So that's basically what we did here uh, when we uh, picked some of those QTL and looked for genes close to them. Uh, we also used uh, some uh, RNA-seq data to detect those that were differentially expressed between the two uh, <laughs> parents. Uh, so that helped kind, kind of helped us a lot in, you know, uh, picking the actual genes we wanted to um, design uh, cost markers, right? So here we have the 
annotation of each one of these genes. This is using IPOMIA tree that they deploy genome, right? Because we don't have the hexaploid genome ready yet. Um, but uh, for sucrose, beta carotene, uh, of course, they are very close uh, associated. And this comes with a question that people asked before about whether they were correlated because of linkage or pleiotropy, right? We could find uh, these uh, different genes very closely positioned in the genome, which kind of guides us to the idea of that they're actually linked. Um, and actually very, very linked, right? We have the ranges here of the, uh, you know, the positions of these genes. And uh, all right, so we, for each one of these genes, we decided to design cast markers. We picked, you know, from five to uh, 15 uh, different SNPs within those genes uh, and tested them in a MTP uh, uh, sample. That's the multiparental population that Marcelo was uh, talking about. A uh, while ago, uh, we used 94 uh, individuals. So we designed 60 in total, and um, 48 of them worked. And what I mean by worked is they produced uh, something similar to this, but not like this, right? Because, well, they're supposed to be uh, polymorphic, but remember, this is based on uh, by a biparental population. So the uh, uh, um, you know output was actually good. And so 48 of them worked, so they look like this. And then we uh, did the uh, uh, dosage column by right, using fit poly. So these are the colored uh, up to seven classes we can have in uh, hexaploids with the brain. So based on the dosage column, we, calling, we uh, ran some uh, linear models, uh, very simple. Uh, either with uh, the idea that the uh, dosage was additive in terms of uh, the changes in the uh, phenotypes or dominant, right? So in this first case for flesh color, uh, we had one. So these are the R squares for all this, the 48 markers we have. The colors represent the additive and the dominant. The, so the red is the additive model, the green is the dominant model for the reference allele. And uh, the blue one is the dominant model for the alternate allele. Um, so we just pick the highest one, right? And in this case, was it an additive model? We can actually see the trend, right, of these flash color um, decreasing as the dosage increases, right? Uh, the plot below shows the linkages equilibrium among the SNPs for uh, this specific sample of 94. Uh, Sweet potatoes. So some of the genes had ended up with, you know, with uh, very highly correlated uh, SNPs, and that's why they all kind of go together uh, uh, with the uh, uh, I-squares, right? So this was the results for flesh color. Uh, this is uh, the results for uh, skin color. So the same thing uh, going on here uh, in terms of um, you know, the association between the SNP and uh, uh, the phenotype. I know some of you are wondering whether these uh, uh, skin colors or flesh colors include, you know, purple ones. And the answer is actually no, uh, because the variation we see here is basically the variation we see for the, the scores people give for the orange ones or the white, yellow ones, you know. Uh, so no purple. Uh, uh, um, skin colors. Um, all right, so I'm not mentioning it, but you can see also the I squared values we are getting out of these uh, samples, right? Up to you know 0.5 in the case of the skin color. And this is interesting because, of course, at first we thought, uh, let's see if it works, right? Just because it was so easy to phenotype them, uh, but it turns out that the breeders are actually very interested in implementing them because. Uh, even though it's the skin color, it's very easy to uh, assess. You're just gonna assess it later in the in the in the field, right? So we, you don't actually have to wait for them. You can just you know use the markers to select the seedlings you want to bring to the field. You might have you know a product profile that says I need a purple flash color, right? Uh, and this is for firmness because it's actually a um, 
uh, phenotype that we don't have, uh, you know, any QTL information, but it's uh, associated with uh, beta amylase. Uh, so we tested it. So we have we have the phenotypes for this uh, MDP population, and then we tested it. We found a R square of almost you know 0.2, which was uh, not so surprising because the correlation is minus four, uh, four at 0 0.4, right? So it explains a little bit of the variation, but not totally. And we are, of course, moving, right? Our uh, trends of having higher uh, R squares from the chromosome three uh, to chromosome 12 and then chromosome 13, right? Oh, sorry, I, for, I forget to mention that uh, this was actually selected for, for a dominance model, right? So the dominant model was uh, preferred in, in, in this case, which was, I think it was the only one we actually had uh, the dominant model, uh, which is also the case of uh, nematodes. Um, and finally, dry matter, uh, we found some of these higher correlations, uh, R squares, here for the chromosome uh, three with the emphasis of, of this is NIP, also a trend of uh, additive um, uh, genetic control. Yes, so very quickly talking about uh, quality assessment and quality control, because again, that's how we started uh, dealing with uh, cost markers. We wanted to know whether we had, you know, any mislabeling or whether the individuals we got from a cross were actually uh, the ones we expected. Uh, so we also tested in a MPP sample, uh, the 60 SNPs we developed. Uh, we only had 34 at first uh, that actually worked. So they look like this. We, um, after we uh, verified them in the MTP sample, in the small MTP sample, we uh, evaluate them in uh, four different uh, reading populations, or you know, a set of parents from uh, four different reading programs, uh, just to see if we had any you know overlaps in terms of uh, individuals. Um, so we started uh, doing the analysis with uh, 30 selected SNPs out of those uh, 34 that we had before. Uh, so 27 worked well when we. Uh, you know, did the, the uh, genotype calling or the dosage calling, and then we use them for, you know, disambiguation, um, estimating genetic distances and seeing whether the individuals are the same or not, which is actually pretty nice also to show that if we use the limited information that comes from, you know, inner tech or LGC in terms of uh, the diploid calling, which is just zero, one, and twos, right, we are going to get something like this. So lots of individuals are go together because, well, they're maybe closely related, but they're not actually the same, right? Uh, and we can actually distinguish them, uh, these individuals, when we use, you know, the dosage information, which is just more informative. And I guess everyone here knows it already, but it's just important to emphasize that. Um, another expectation we had was like to use them for pedigree confirmation. And, we, and then we had that type of structure, Marcel talked, you know, of having all those individuals crossed. Uh, so we knew that they were uh, F1s, but it turns out it doesn't work. So we did some simulations also with a tool that uh, Jeff talked about uh, last uh, workshop called Mode Polytop uh, to see how many markers we would need uh, for that. Uh, and in the case of hexaploid, I also have, you know, simulations for diploid and tetraploids, but it turns out for hexaploids, we just need too many, like over 90 uh, SNPs, which is, becomes just the pricing of doing mid-density panels. All right, so as we saw, some of these cost markers were uh, not tested uh, for their um, uh, phenotypes yet because we don't have them, uh, but they are there, they are developed, and if anyone wants to try, uh, they're available. Uh, beta amylase contents negatively associated with firmness, as I mentioned. Uh, so only we can only explain uh, the variation for firmness partially using the uh, cost for beta amylase. Uh, so the F call, the flash color was designed for orange uh, by, by white flashed uh, sweet potatoes. So they are limited to that range of uh, uh, variation. The cost also seem useful for 
uh, QA and QC. And remember, these are different set of uh, markers, right? So we have 120 total actually uh, that we have tested. So the uh, design was based on a uh, Lindsay Clark uh, script that is also publicly available. And uh, the set of markers, at least for the QA QC, is also available on the uh, Excellence in Grading uh, website. So I know some people are already using it, which is great. So thank you for uh, listening.